Kia ora, Robert McLaughlin here. Welcome to lecture three for week 11. Lecture title is Chaos. What is this all about? Well, we're studying systems of nonlinear differential equations. And we looked at different kinds of orbits, different kinds of solutions, for example, fixed points, very simple. Then we saw, in particular, when we went to planar systems, two-dimensional systems, we could get more complicated dynamical behavior like periodic solutions. Uh, we saw settle points. We saw a few uh, spirals. We saw a few different types of behavior. So you might think as we went to higher dimensions or more complicated systems, it would continue like that with gradually adding more and more slightly more complex phenomena. But that is not really the case. What happens is as soon as you get to three dimensions, there's this enormous explosion in potential complexity and you have the possibility of chaotic orbits. So chaotic behavior in dynamical systems is one of the fundamental uh, features of nature basically and it's exhibited here in this example. Uh, this guy Ed Lorenz in the 1960s was an atmospheric physicist. He derived these differential equations as a simple model of some convection rolls in the atmosphere and when he solved them on a very early computer from the 1960s, he got very strange results that he initially didn't understand. So let's see what he got. It's quite simple, right? Uh, the phase spaces are three, three differential equations, and the right-hand side are quadratic functions of x, y, and z. So we could do what we did earlier, which was to be to find all the fixed points and linearize and so on, but instead let's do another approach of just simulating the system on a computer using ODE45 and MATLAB to solve it and see what we get. Then you get a picture like this. So this is not a phase portrait, this is just the first component of the solution plotted against time for t going from 0 to 100. And you see what's going on here, it jumps around a little bit at first, then it oscillates, oscillates a bit with the oscillations getting bigger and then it jumps, and then it oscillates and then it jumps back again. So it seems to have two different things it does. It can oscillate either near x equals 10 or near x equals negative 10. And in both cases, the oscillations grow until it jumps to the other state. And if you look along between, just in this simple example for time going between 0 and 100, it seems to spend quite variable amounts of time in each state. It's jumping back and forth. Now it's not jumping back and forth at random because the solution x of t is determined as a function of the initial conditions. For a given initial condition, the differential equation tells you where it's going to go, but it does look random. This is an example of a chaotic orbit. If instead of plotting x against t, you plot that same solution in the phase space, then you get this amazing picture. So now you see there's a bit of order to the randomness, you can see here where it's uh, spiraling around the x equals 10, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and then jumping and then spiraling out, and then jumping back and spiraling out again. But there's a beautiful shape emerges, this famous butterfly picture. It's called the Lorenz attractor. It turns out if you start with other initial conditions, like maybe somewhere way, way over here, you will still see the same picture. It will very rapidly fall onto there and then it will do the same thing, jumping back and forth. This is an example of a chaotic strange attractor. Now, how could you study such a thing? One of the very important features of chaotic solutions is this phenomenon called sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So let's imagine starting out with two very nearby initial conditions. Oops. So I've got one initial condition here, I'll call that x0, and one initial condition here, which I'll call x1, and you have to imagine that distance, I'll call it d, being very, very small, like 10 to the minus 10. So small you can hardly measure it. So they'll start going along the same way. But then they might drift away, drift apart, and the question is, what is the distance between them? Let's call this one x naught of t, 
this one x1 of t, what is the distance between them? And it turns out it, this will grow very rapidly. It will be approximately equal to some constant times e to the lambda t, or some constants a and a lambda. You'll have exponential growth in the distance. And you can measure that very easily. So here in this picture, uh, we've taken two initial conditions. We've taken the initial distance between them is 10 to the minus 10. So very, very small indeed. So small you can't see it initially. And the two solutions here have been plotted on top of, top of one another. And you see initially they follow each other quite closely. But then suddenly, whoop, about t in the high 20s they start to drift apart and then suddenly they're doing something completely different. So by t equals 50 the two solutions are now completely far apart. And if you measure the distance between them how should you do that? Well you should take logs log of d is log a plus lambda t then you, if you graph the log of the distance against time, you'll get a straight line of slope lambda. And that's exactly what we observe here. The log of the distance increases. This is natural log, so this 10 to the minus 10 is about e to the minus 25. It's increasing like a straight line, which means exponential growth in the distance until the two points are on completely other side, opposite sides of that uh, butterfly, and then it can't increase anymore. Now they're far apart. Now what this means is there will be some precision with respect to which you, sh you could measure the initial conditions in a real physical system. Even 10 to the minus 10, 10 digits of accuracy is really far too much. And that means there will be a limit to how accurate, for how long you can predict the future state. This is a really fundamental physical phenomenon. This is the, the fundamental reason why predicting the future is difficult. The atmosphere obeys physical laws basically evolving f equals ma, we know what the forces are, but we can only measure the current state to a certain accuracy, and that accuracy will limit the ability to predict the for forecast the future weather accurately out to, in fact, out to a few days. This is just seen in all kinds of systems all over the place. So it turns out you cannot have this phenomenon of chaos, sensitive dependence on initial conditions and strange attractors in a one or a two-dimensional differential equation, but you can in three or more dimensions. So the Lorentz equation is sort of the, the simple example, and it's already a little bit complicated. So you could ask the question, well, how can I study this phenomenon of chaos through a simple model system so that I can get a handle on what's going on here? And that has been done. So here's a very, very um, simple but also profound model system that also exhibits chaos in just in one dimension. It's called the logistic equation because it looks uh, sufficiently like the logistic differential equation, but it's not a differential equation. It's a discrete time system. Instead of following along a smooth curve, it hops from x0 to x1 to x2, it bounces around just on a line. It is one dimensional, which makes it a lot simpler. It's got this parameter in it, a, and changing the parameter a will change the behavior of this map quite quite dramatically. So this map is just one dimensional, this, this discrete time system, and it already exhibits chaos and sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So here's two nearby initial conditions. They differ by uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 5. So x0, 0.7, x1 is 0 0.84, 0 0.53760, and so on. It's sort of jumping around at random between 0 and 1. Let's look at the difference between them. Well, here I've got a difference of um, 2 in the last place. Here I've got a difference of uh, 4 in the last place. Here I've got a difference of uh, 1. Oh dear, they seem to have got closer together again. But no, now the difference is 5. Now it's 19. 
Now it's uh, 65. Now they're drifting apart. Now it's uh, 94. Now it's 278. So now we see something more like the long time behavior. Exponential growth here in the distance. It seems to be roughly, I don't know, doubling or tripling or something with every step. What else can you do with this system? Well, you can study how the solutions vary or the dynamical behavior varies as you change the parameter a. And that's what's done on the next picture. Because here I've got the phase space. It's just one dimensional. X just goes between 0 and 1. And here I've got the parameter. That goes from 1 to 4. So we're plotting the dynamical behavior in the vertical directions. And what this says is that if A is 2, for example, in the long run, all you'll observe is everything tend to, tending to x equals 0.5. So all this behavior along here is a unique, asymptotically stable fixed point. So when the parameter A is less than 3, you get very boring dynamics. Everything just tends to a stable fixed point. But over here, something new happens. Now I get a period 2 point. Back and forth. Forever. It's a stable period 2 point. And what's happened at this critical point here is called a bifurcation. So that's a parameter value at which the phase portrait looks qualitatively, qualitatively different on both sides of that parameter value. Now I see more bifurcations. Oh, I've gone to a period 4 point, and then at some critical value of A, before I was doing A equals 4, at some critical value of A, order completely breaks down, and then I have chaos. So this is very typical in a transition to chaos. You go from st simple behavior to more complicated and then suddenly to a chaotic orbit.